So first of all, I would like to thank you all for receiving me today and giving me the opportunity to express myself. Considering that I will be speaking about political facts, I would like to start by making the following statement. Nothing that would be expressed throughout my speech should be considered as a political opinion, but rather as a neutral form of analysis. So the subject that I chose to talk about and my aim throughout this conference will be to show you how come art is political in so many different ways. Indeed, the arts are often misperceived because people don't look at them, don't seek their core message and, 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 uh, um, and true meaning, but rather look at them in a very superficial manner. I talked about it with a friend of mine the other day at a party. He was telling me that he didn't really understand how come an artwork that he considers beautiful can be, let's say, estimated one million. And how come another artwork that, according to him, is not that relevant can be estimated more than one million because this artwork to him is not that beautiful. I told him that he was saying it in a very superficial way for the simple reason that he was not considering the colors, the dimensions, the artist himself, and so many other things that must be considered before uh, judging an, a work of art. L'art, c'est le plus court chemin de l'homme à l'homme. The art is the shortest path from man to man. By this very enlightening quote of André Malraux, we can get that art is inherent to our heritage, that arts are and have always been part of, of what makes our society. And they are an integral part of what makes mankind. In fact, every society starts to decline at the exact moment when one is satisfied by a form of constancy coming from artistic disciplines. And it's true when we think about it. We started to create art for a peculiar reason. Education. We started creating arts for telling stories, for making history and transmitting our knowledge to the next generations. But not only have we used it for doing that, but we have also used it for building our houses, for uh, making our temples and other places of worship, and also for making our graves. Thereby, art has flourished in so many different ways. Through art, architecture, design, fashion, and so many different. But how come is it political? Well, in order to respond to this question, I have chosen three different perspectives for the simple reason that I consider that the difference of meaning conveyed by an artwork now and by the time of its creation is really important. The first artwork that I will be talking about is L'Origine du Monde, the Courbet, the origin of the world, which was painted in 1866 and now is at the site of all at the um, Musée d'Orsay in Paris. So what can we see by looking at this painting? What, can we what could we consider? Well, no one we could consider it as feminist. And it's true to some extent, it is feminist. I mean, it diffuses any voyeuristic gaze. And the nature of the painting itself, as much as its title, are feminist. It raises even a lot of questions. Some could consider it blasphemous, since it considers that the most carnal part of uh, a woman's body is the origin of the world. But the thing is that we only get to know the real meaning and the real political connotation of this artwork when we, when we see that a lot of artists have been very inspired by it. The first of them is Deborah de Robertis, who has made a performance on the 29th of May uh, 2014 at the Musée d'Orsay. So basically what she's done is she sat in front of the painting, legs wide open, while showing her warmest color to the visitors by repeating over and over again, I am the origin, I am old woman, you didn't see me, I want you to recognize me, virgin like water, creator of sperm. Until, of course, the people from the security asked her to, to kindly follow them. Another artist has been very well inspired by it. Her name is Orlan, when she has created uh, L'Origine de la Guerre, the origin of the war, in uh, 1989. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank her for uh, giving us the rights for displaying her work. So um, the point of view of Orlan there is quite feminist for the simple reason that 
she doesn't consider, she wants us to ask herself questions about feminism. And she considers that we shouldn't see feminism anymore as a form of, of exact opposite of what machismo is, but rather as a form of egalitarianism. The main reason why both of these artists have uh, been very inspired by L'Origine du Monde of Courbet is because even though now on we could consider that it is feminist, in reality, it's not. A loophole appears in this very anachronistic form of masculine feminism. Courbet only cuts the body to present us a trunk. There is no woman identity represented there. There is only a sex, a simple piece of flesh. And this example exactly shows us that we have to be more critical with what uh, we consider, as uh, sometimes the reality is quite different. It also shows us that art never stops evolving with time, and that even centuries after uh, the realization of an artwork, um, its uh, um, political connotation what might have changed. Which brings us to the second dimension of my expose. Art is used as a medium for co conveying political ideas. In order to speak about that, I will start by um, speaking about the eighth form of art, which is broadcasting. So my question is, what has been the very first political worldwide live uh, broadcasted event? Well, it has been the opening speech of the 1936 Olympic Games, organized in Berlin and made by no other than Adolf Hitler. It has also been the very first uh, television transmission that has been powerful enough to escape into outer space. What does that mean? That means that if there are other uh, forms of life in our uh, universe, the first images that they will receive from us are those. Clearly, Hitler has benefited from, uh, from this outbreak for his propaganda. And as Marshall McLuhan's, Mike Lunen says, um, the artist will only be too happy to abdicate, the politician will only be happy to abdicate in favor of his image, because his image will, will be way more polit uh, powerful than it could ever be. So broadcasting is, uh, is therefore uh, used as a, a, a way, as a medium for conveying uh, political ideas, but so is cinema. The movie The Interview has been released in 2014. It's an American uh, uh, spy comedy movie that, uh, uh, where you have two interviewers that uh, get to meet North Korea's leader, but are in the same time, um, asked, uh, in the same time asked by the CIA to assassinate him. It has had two very strong kind of, uh, reactions. The very first one has been in June 2014 when North Korea threatens actions against the United States. The second one has been made by a hacker groups, a group called um, the Guardians of Peace, who uh, threatened action against uh, Sony and Columbia Pictures if the movie were to be released. Thereby, uh, Sony had kind of no choice to, to take it off from um, the US market. The, um, the artworks are often political, but so are the artists, quite often. Let's talk about Charlie Chaplin a little bit. He couldn't have been, uh, he couldn't have taken part in a more political artwork than the great dictator that was released in 1945, especially considering his very renowned final speech. Yet, uh, under McCarthyism in the 50s, um, everything has changed. Indeed, under McCarthyism's influence, in the United States, a form of witch had appeared uh, hunting down all the, the people that were suspected to be communists. A lot of artists were uh, in between all of them, in between those people, and were scapegoated. Charlie Chaplin, as well as many other people, has been um, blacklisted from Hollywood, and of course forbidden to, to appear there. Street art. Street art is, without any doubt, one of the most political form of art that it exists. It's often rebellious, it's often rebellious and it, uh, um, it expresses freedom of speech, freedom of expression. But it has been used in the framework of the Northern Ireland uh, conflict that uh, lasted in the late 20th century, for over 30 years. The both, it, it pitted um, the Unionists and, and, and Loyalists that were mainly Protestants against the Republicans and Nationalists that were mainly Catholics. 
The Belfast murals um, constitute one of the strongest uh, uh, form of, of world propaganda in the world. And they have been denouncing all of the violences that um, occurred there for over 30 years. Which brings us to uh, the third dimension of my expose. How come cultural sites can be centers of political tensions? In order to talk a little bit about that, I will start by talking about the ancient city of Palmyra. So what is Palmyra? It's an ancient city that, ha that is composed of many temples and other places of worship, each praising different cultures and beliefs. So you have temples celebrating local deities, Mesopotamian, Greek, Roman, Arabic, and Catholic gods that constitute this ancient city, a nest made of cultural diversity. The Palmyra has had uh, and has a very strong connotation in the confrontation of globalization, of extremism, for the simple reason that in May 2015, ISIS has, has taken over uh, the place and started uh, uh, destroying it, started destroying the UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Syrian armies, thanks to uh, the help of the Russians, have also have uh, taken it back in March 2016, and um, Palmyra has had a very strong other political connotation at that moment, on the 5th of May 2016, when uh, a concert was organized in the middle of the ruins by um, the Symphony Orchestra of St. Petersburg. Unfortunately, ever since uh, December 2016, ISIS has taken back uh, um, Palmyra and uh, keeps on destroying its artworks. And when they are not destroying it, their artworks, they're selling them in order to finance themselves. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the Acropolis, and particularly the Parthenon uh, in Greece, in Athens. It has been built in the mid-5th uh, century before Christ um, in, in, um, in the celebration of, uh, um, of a victory against the, the Persian Empire. It has also been built in order to, to hold the treasury of the Delian League. Uh, that is a league, an association that was made... Um, in between all of the Greek city-states. Well, the thing is that the, par the Parthenon has had a very strong uh, connotation over the centuries for the simple reason that not only has it been converted into a church, but also into a mosque. But more recently, a new form of, of political, political tension has, has been uh, woven from, from, from it. But the simple fact that uh, most of its frescoes and marbles are not exposed at the Acropolis Museum in Athens, but mostly held at the British Museum, and some of them are at uh, the Louvre. A lawsuit has uh, therefore appeared as much as uh, political tensions between the United Kingdom and Greece, and uh, the lawyer who is taking care of, uh, of defending the Parthenon and Greece's uh, in Greece is uh, Amal Kune, for his wife. So what is art and where can we find it? Well, art, we can find it in sculptures, we can find it in performances, we can find it in paintings, we can find it in music, in cinema, in broadcasting, we can find it everywhere. For the simple reason that art is nothing besides a certain way of seeing the world. I want to know if you can see beauty even though it's not pretty every day. I hope that thanks to my speech, uh, you are able to see that there is so much to learn from art and so much to analyze. I hope that you will be more critical and more curious in the future while looking at something and that you will understand that there are consequences that explain what you're looking at. And I really hope that now you understand how from art is political in so many different ways.